Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. You know, some LDS leaders frown on popular speakers. Why is that? We'll talk about that with Dr. Margaret Toscano of the University of Utah, and she has some interesting ideas there. It could be that some leaders are threatened when popular leaders are more popular speakers are more popular than they are. We'll talk about how charisma can be a problem for the leadership. Check out our conversation. I mean, in a way, you could say that that's part of the Denver Snuffer movement, right? Okay. Uh, the notion of, because really, I mean, I think that's really interesting, that whole movement. And, you know, it's not just Denver, but other people where they feel like the church no longer has spiritual gifts and that if you don't have spiritual gifts, you're not really a follower of Christ. Well, those are, but you know what, maybe I should define charismatic, right? I've been using that term. So charismatic comes from a Greek word, charisma, which has to do, I mean, we think of charisma, and charisma is sort of a person's, you know, kind of um, force or energy that kind of makes you attracted to them, right? But if you go back to the Greek word, it has to do with three things. It has to do with um, both a spiritual power kind of grace, but also almost connected as well with spiritual gifts. So if you have charismatic power in a spiritual sense or in a religious sense, you display these uh, gifts of God, the spiritual power that whether you have an office or not, I would say it's very powerful. And one of the big problems in any organization and the church basically has done this by kind of downplaying the charismatic, right? Because if you get, I mean, but you see this in the church. I don't know how this is manifest now, but I remember when I was young, which is a long time ago, right? Um, that they were always afraid of the popular church speaker, right? Yes. Or uh, George Pace. Remember George Pace at BYU? Did you ever know about that? No, I don't think so. George I, Pace was Paul a, Dunn's the one that comes yes, to mind. Yes, but he was a church leader, but even so, that's frightening, right? What if you have somebody who's more interesting and spiritually powerful than the prophet of the church? That's a problem. It's a problem. So let's not encourage that. So most of your listeners probably don't know. We'll get into this little tangent. So George Pace was a very popular religion teacher at BYU. And he emphasized having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and um, spiritual experiences and transformation. And the church saw him as very dangerous. He had a huge following. He wrote a book. He, you know, at um, church education, he was the most popular speaker. Everybody wanted to hear him. Well. Bruce McConkie, who's sort of the predecessor of Boyd Packer, right, did not like that and gave a talk. He did two things, and, and I may be getting my, I'm not sure I have my facts right, but he did something to curb, uh, to kind of, um, basically I think that Pace was threatened of losing his job if he didn't sort of walk away from all of that. Start speaking poorly. <laughs> or not speak, right, and not publish, kind of what I was threatened with. Not publishing, not speaking, you can lose your job. He's not the only one that happened to. Again, this there's a lot of history lost, right? And then Bruce McConkie got up and he gave a talk about the danger of having a personal relationship with Christ, which, of course, on one level you kind of laugh and think, how can that be bad? Right? Yeah, yeah. How can that be bad to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Isn't that what the scriptures well, all say, right? if you don't right? follow the prophet, then it's bad, right? Does that sense That's right? exactly. Well, not only is it bad if you don't follow the prophet, because George Pace always gave, um, he always talked about the importance of the church, the leaders following the prophet. But he was kind of saying, well, you know, that's one part of your religion, following the prophet doing keeping the commandments he wasn't speaking against that but if you really want to have a good spiritual life you need to have this personal relationship with Christ so it's interesting that he was seen as a threat and this is kind of why he brought him up as the example he was not questioning the leaders I mean unlike my husband who did critique them but he actually Paul's main critique of the leaders was that 
they were more corporate, they were more interested in corporate power than they were in the gospel of grace of Jesus Christ. That was Paul's main criticism. And I guess you could say it re relates to what George Pace got in trouble for. But, so it's, but Paul did directly critique the leaders. He didn't say that they weren't true leaders. He didn't say they didn't have authority. He just said that they weren't using it correctly, which is a kind of an Old Testament prophetic thing. You critique the power structure, right? But George Pace was really just trying, he was trying to encourage people to have a, a more full spiritual life. And to go back to the Denver Snuffer movement or the remnant, they don't all say that they, you know, Denver doesn't claim to be their prophet. But in a way, if you look at that whole movement, it's about the idea, and I think this, there are people who think, well, you know, I go to church, it's boring, you know, we always hear the same old stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to be a good member. I go to the temple, I do all that, that but I feel empty inside. I don't feel like I have a spiritual life. And I think the movement of Denver Snuffer and the Remnant is a reaction to that, saying we want a manifestation of the Spirit of God and kind of not just, oh, I have a, I'm doing what's right and, you know, I kind of feel, a, you know, good when I read the scriptures or something, but you actually have, you know, what you would see in Kirtland or something at the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, where you have, you know, spiritual manifestations in some way. So... I think those were important to Joseph Smith, but he was trying to say, you know, yeah, if you just have charismatic priesthood, it's very powerful, it's real, but it can be dangerous by itself too. On the other hand, if you only have ecclesiastical priesthood and you just are all by the book, there can be a deadness. So for Joseph Smith, you needed to combine them. The power of charisma, of spiritual gifts, of spirituality, with the power of an organization. And, and so he would say, because if you're going to have a real Zion, which is a, a literal thing, you know, the law of consecration, kinship alliances and sealings, and, and we have no poor among us, um, it's a physical thing. And we need organization, <laughs> right? And we need order. We need order, back to your example of, you know, you go off and marry and whatever, right? Some doe head of an elder is my Some favorite. Some doe head of an elder. <laughs> my favorite phrase, I swear. Well, I mean, and there are always examples of BYU where men will use their pri priesthood to try to say to a woman, you should marry me because the pre I have the priesthood and the Spirit has told me that you're going to be my wife, right? <laughs> right? So it's it still happens on another level, right? So... Um, yeah, it's interesting, but I really see that he was trying to bring all of those things together, but I don't think he worked it out. So the way that I see it now is that I would, the way I would describe it is I would say, any endowed woman is endowed with Melchizedek priesthood. If you... But not ecclesiastical priesthood. So you sound exactly. very similar to Mike Quinn's, because that's basically what he said in my interview. But, but I would also say you have the right to be part of the ecclesiastical order because you have the you have the Melchizedek priesthood. What? Now I would also say that the endowment itself gives you the Melchizedek priesthood. The 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 second anointing, which again, and there's a difference, Joseph Smith would say this, just having an ordinance doesn't give you the spiritual transformation, which he th thought both were important. But I would say if you're actually I think the people that Joseph Smith anointed to the fullness in Nauvoo, they all saw themselves as that. I think the women, women like Bathsheba Smith, Eliza R. Snow, they believed that because they had received the fullness of the priesthood through Joseph Smith, that they had the right to act in the priesthood without getting permission from Brigham Young. That Eliza Snow felt she had the right to give blessings through the power of the priesthood. I mean, there's a quote where she says, without the priesthood, you can't anoint, you can only kind of do it with faith. But then she further said, and that's not always quoted, if you're an endowed woman with the, pri with the Melchizedek priesthood, you can use the name of the priesthood to give a blessing. 
On your own, not on your husband's priesthood. Because mm -mm. I think there was a question in those early days yeah. about whether no, no, no. And it, it, priesthood. But it develops. And again, I actually trace this in that article on the sort of the chronological order of it. Um, but so, I mean, I don't know if I completely agree with Mike or not, because I do believe the endowment gives you the priesthood. But in order to function the church, then the leaders have to acknowledge your priesthood. And then, of course, you know, getting a calling or being set apart to function the church is another thing. Well, and th yeah, so that so, brings up two things. That's kind of what Mike said. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But the other, the other thought that comes to my mind is we believe that men must be called of God, God by laying on of hands. So if Joseph Smith, I turn the key to you, he's not laying hands on every woman. But every woman has hands laid upon her in the temple. I would see that as a, and but in fact, there's more than one. Well, there's more than one mechanism. So we focus on that one thing, the laying on of hands. But if you actually look at what Joseph Smith did and the sort of history, that there are, that so the the endowment going through the endowment, the the you're you're going through a ritual that has a series of stages that bestow priesthood upon you. So you have. The charismatic priesthood, uh, maybe I shouldn't use that word because it's strange for people, but the spiritual priesthood, which just comes from God. I mean, you can have... You Joseph don't need laying on of hands for this. No, you do not. Okay. Because in fact, Joseph Smith said, I mean, he again, he always felt that the spiritual and the physical needed to be brought together in one. He said, you might as well baptize a bag of sand as a man if they aren't reborn as it describes in the New Testament. If there's not a, you know, this kind of spiritual awakening, the, the baptism is a symbol of that you die to the old person and you're renewed, right? It's a rebirth symbol. But that didn't mean he didn't think that you had to wait to, and, and actually in Christianity, they've argued over this, whether or not, this goes back to the Puritans, they would argue about, you know, do you need to show some kind of, of um, of sign of grace in order to then be part of the covenant people. And he would say, well, you know, the ordinance, because I think that he also believed that the ordinances, and this is a little bit of like magic, right? That by doing the ordinance, the ordinance is like a conduit. And again, I think he saw it as literal. The, the, it's a conduit that opens you up to the divine. And, and sometimes the, the spiritual rebirth, it's not like it always happens like in the Book of Mormon where we are born of God. I mean, there are a bunch of examples in the Book of Mormon where it just happens, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it can be a process. But going through the ordinances, I think that, again, they're physical conduits that connect the earthly with the heavenly. And just like, you know, every blessing or rubbing with oil, maybe, you know, and the whole question of what, what does it mean that it worked, right? That's, that's a hard question. You know, if you don't get a, jump up and you're immediately well, was there no efficacy? I, I, these are hard religious questions, right? It's not like they're easy. But he, um, he would say the spiritual transformation, which I've been calling the charismatic priesthood, and the ordinances, which I would say are he saw as a necessary real conduit to open up the spiritual world, and then the ecclesiastical priesthood, which creates a community and orders what, by which it creates a context that people can receive the spiritual power and by which you can uh, perform the ordinances, which become this, well, they also can memorialize the spiritual transformation, but they are, they're both, they, they, they help it along and they also, they, the ordinances, which are all these religious rituals, the liturgy, um, those are all words that are used in different traditions, right? That they both, they can symbolize the inner transformation. They can be an actual conduit to kind of open up and receive God's power, they memorialize it, which is they kind of say it's happened. It's a little bit like a confirmation, right? 
Um, but they also, in the sort of ritual reenactment, they teach us things so that they're teaching mechanisms as well about what, what does this spiritual journey mean? What is the, how is this priesthood functioning? So, yeah, back to the women. And I would say that there's a difference, and here maybe Mike and I disagree. I think that there's a difference between you receive the Melchizedek priesthood through the endowment, but you can't really function in the church Melchizedek priesthood unless you're in, you are in, you know, you're, you're ordained you're, to an office. And, and, uh, and see, that's why I'm in favor of ordaining women, even though, and then I would say that if you receive the fullness of the priesthood, which is a combination of a lot of these things, it's this overarching thing that has the keys and the sealing powers and all other kinds of things connected to it, I think that, that sometimes there's a way in which a person who has that, who is a high priestess in that sense, that you can have a calling, an individual calling, to act in this priesthood that maybe is extra ecclesiastical. But I would argue that if you're doing stupid things like, what was this term again? The dough head of an elder. The dough head. Well, that to me is just a sign that they're not a very good priest whatsoever. Because I think that really what is the, the high priesthood, the fullness as Joseph envisioned it, is that you're part, and this is an interesting thing, I still think that even if you're not part of the church priesthood, you're part of the order of God. And if you're really a truly a, a priest or priestess of God, you're trying to know the will of God and further the work of God, and that you're going to and you're going to display godly attributes, and you'll want to bless those around you. Mm -hmm. That's the purpose of the priesthood: to be personally transformed and to bless others so that they're transformed too, and to bless the whole society so that it's transformed into something other than greed and violence, <laughs> which is what we seem to have a lot of now. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Margaret Toscano. In our next conversation, we'll talk about early Relief Society leaders such as Bathsheba Smith. How did she feel about Relief Society? But they had a very strong feeling that the Relief Society was a, the women's priesthood organization and that their mission was just crucial for the church to be in the right order, that you had to have an organization for women that was not just, oh, an auxiliary, but it was centrally a priesthood organization. And they saw themselves as high priestesses in this order. I mean, I think the evidence is clear. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, please support Gospel Tangents and become a subscriber. For just $5 a month, go to uh, patreon.com slash gospel tangents and you can hear the entire interview and you can also get uh, transcripts available at either our Amazon website or if you want to give the money to me and not Amazon please subscribe on my website at gospeltangents.com and you can click the yellow subscribe button of course we're also on Facebook Twitter and all the other places uh, make sure you subscribe on iTunes at tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and don't forget to click here to subscribe on YouTube here for a transcript. And over here, we've got some more of our great videos. Thanks again for listening.